Hello everyone, welcome to the MATLAB and Simulink Racing Lounge. And in this video, we'll talk about how the solar team Eindhoven used MATLAB to do weather forecasting for their World Solar Challenge race. We have Niels with us. Hey Niels, how are you doing? Hi Shrub, thanks for hosting me, I'm doing great. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we move on to the technical part of the presentation? Sure. So my name is Niels Terfsa. I'm from Solar Team Eindhoven from the Netherlands. I was actually part of the 2017 team where I was uh, responsible for uh, the aerodynamics of the car, and some production of the car, and also the strategy of our race where I was particularly responsible for the weather forecasting system. Okay. So what do we have for today? So first of all, I will give a little introduction about what Solar Team Eindhoven is. Then I will give a little overview of what our weather forecasting system is. Then I will give a little software demo where I show off our system and we will end this video with our key takeaways. Solar Team Eindhoven is a student team based in Eindhoven. It consists of around 20 students. It's a biannual team where uh, every team builds a family solar car. The Bridgestone World Solar Challenge is a race in Australia where we need to travel 3,000 kilometers from the north of Australia to the south of Australia. In fact, our score, as you can see, it's uh, passengers times the uh, amount of kilometers that you've driven with these passengers divided by the external energy that you use. So, of course, if you carry more passengers, you will also use a little bit more energy. Let's say if you switch from one to two passengers, you're not going to use twice as much energy, and therefore it's profitable in this class to drive with uh, multiple passengers, which is why we drove with five passengers. The external energy is uh, basically you are allowed to charge, but you will get a penalty because the more external energy you will use, uh, lower your score will be. And in the end, you need to finish within a two-hour time frame on the last day, which is actually on a Friday, and you start off on a Sunday. comes down to two things. So if you have more sun, well, you will need less external energy, and you can carry around more passengers during the race. But if you have more headwind, it's going to cost you more energy if there's headwind. So therefore, uh, one of the options we have is then to uh, take less passengers uh, with us. So uh, just to clarify here, since your strategy is dependent on the sun and the headwind, that is why weather forecasting is an integral part of your race strategy, right? Oh, yes, it's, it's super important. So, well, at the end of the race, what you want to have is an empty battery. And uh, for that, you need to know the weather conditions for the coming six days because you're actually going to drive six days. If you, let's say, overpredict the sun, uh, then you're not going to make it. But if you underpredict the sun or the headwind, then you are going to actually charge more external energy than what's actually needed, or you will not take as much people as you could have taken with you. So here we have a little overview of our system. Well, we will start on the left side of our figure in the weather sources uh, block. There are a few, let's say, supercomputers running a few times a day uh, calculating a weather prediction. And we are actually downloading these raw files on a server. So these files are huge because they have a two and a half kilometers resolution. You can imagine that this sort of stuff blows up. And we only need the latitude and longitude for Australia. And we only need the time window uh, for our race. OK, so why do we crop this? It's because uh, we are racing in the uh, Australian desert. And there's not a lot of <laughs> internet there. Or Sometimes you will have satellite internet, but that's, uh, uh, let's say, very expensive. What we, in the end, want to get from our weather forecasting is a irradiance, so uh, how much sun, and a wind velocity prediction um, over distance and time. So in this case, distance is going to range from 0 to 3,000, and time is going to go from the first day to the last day of the race. And then we send this weather forecast into our, what we call a long-term strategy, which basically gives us uh, a velocity profile over time, telling us, well, this is the velocity which you need to drive at this particular time. So you can imagine that on day two, there are a lot of clouds. Then you maybe 
want to drive faster on day two because you want to skip those clouds, right? And then we also have our what's called what we call live predictions, where we constantly uh, check if our car is uh, performing as we think it should be doing. And into this go our car parameters, so our coefficient of drag, our rolling resistance. So today we're gonna mainly focus on the weather forecasting system, and our goal is to give an irradiance and wind prediction over the route. So we're gonna combine multiple forecasts into one forecast. First of all, I'm gonna show a single forecast, and then I'm gonna show what we call a custom forecast. A single forecast is just, for instance, the uh, supercomputer running in Australia, but in the end, what we call our custom forecast is our ensemble of the Australian forecast, the US forecast, the European forecast, uh, and how we stitch all of those forecasts together is basically uh, one of the main parts of the demo today. All right, so here we are. I've uh, fired up my uh, MATLAB editor, and I'm quickly going to show you uh, a single forecast. I'm going to go to our a file I've prepared before, plot demo forecast, it's loading some stuff, the route and the land sea mask, which is basically uh, just going to show us Australia. And then here it's going to plot our weather forecast. So let's just run this file and see what happens. What do we see here? Here we see uh, Australia and here we see the route of the World Soda Challenge. So as you can see, it's uh, through the middle of Australia from north to south. Uh, so we start here in Darwin, and we end up here at the end in Adelaide. And we have a few stops along the route, which I've also uh, uh, marked with a black dot. So the color bar is uh, denoting the intensity of the soda irradiance, so basically how much sun there's falling on Australia at this particular moment. And if it's a higher value, then it's uh, sunnier. You can see that this is when it's on the 30th of July, uh, this is a uh, local time. We can see that uh, in Australia, of course, the equator is uh, to the north. Uh, so that's why it's uh, more intense on top and uh, less intense on the bottom. And we can actually, um, if I hit my spacebar, we can see it will run for another time. And then, so this is one time step ahead. We can see that it's colder over here, or at least there's less sun. We can also see some clouds in this forecast, because, for instance, here you can see that there's a big dip in the irradiance, so that's uh, probably denoting clouds. So this is, for instance, also probably a cloud. So if I hit my spacebar once again, we should see it moving a little bit to the left. And you can see that uh, the top is actually indeed moving to the left, and here we see some, some clouds coming in. That's, that's basically uh, the idea of uh, a single forecast. But, of course, the real challenge is that we have these sort of forecasts for different sources, and we want to combine them into one prediction. What is the advantage of uh, combining multiple forecasts? That's a very good question. Yeah, first of all, you don't want to blindly trust one source, because if then uh, it's going to make a single mistake, then it's going to hit you really hard. And you also want to check if um, the predictions of all the forecasts are kind of the same. Then that's giving you an indication of the uh, uncertainty of the forecast, which is uh, very important for us because if the weather down the road is really uncertain, then we can decide to take more risk by still going with a lot of people uh, in our car or uh, we want to decrease risk by unloading people from our car. That's why we want to combine multiple resources. All right, um, so I'm going to close this, and we are going to have a look at how we combine these different forecasts. So this is our little uh, script which we use to uh, stitch together the forecasts. Here you can see the different sources. So I have four sources, GEM and GFS is USA, I think. And then we have access RNG, which basically is the regional model of access, which is the Australian uh, uh, government model, and then we have the global model as well. So let's just uh, fire it up and uh, see what happens. So it's now processing our latest uh, files that I have prepared for this demo, and these come from our little server, which I was talking about earlier. So it says initialize. There it is. 
if you remember, uh, we started in Darwin. And this is actually uh, a map of our total cloud coverage. So it's going from 0 to 0 0.8, where uh, 0 0.8 is very cloudy, uh, and 0 is actually no clouds. And here we can see on the x-axis, we can see time. We are starting on the 29th of July, which is uh, just something I've made up for this demo. And, well, you can see the different control stops. Uh, so Catherine, Tennant Creek, and Alice Springs. So these are different cities in uh, Australia, which we are passing. And then we could be camping there. But it's uh, good to have a sort of a uh, reference point. And then on the y-axis, you can see the distance we have traveled. So it's, this is only for the first part of the race, which is from 0 to 1,500 kilometers. So it's half of the race. And another thing we can see is that actually for the first part of our race, there is no forecast available in this case. So that's why it's uh, showing a white part there. I've done that to show what could possibly happen if you don't have any information. So I see that sometimes the distance plot that you have over time is flat, right? What does that mean? Does that mean the car is not moving then, and why would it not be moving? Yeah, so that's uh, actually because uh, we are only racing between uh, 8 and 5 during the day. So that's uh, at 5 o'clock we stop, and then that's why the distance uh, is actually flat over there. And then the next day we go on driving again. So that's why also the, the black dots of the cities are only in the part where there is a slope in the in the graph because otherwise we're sleeping, right? So here we can see that uh, this specific weather uh, forecast says that there are going to be clouds over here. But we want to actually know what the other predictions are telling us about that uh, particular cloud. So we're going to draw a little box around it. Yes. And then... On the right, it's going to show us different cloud predictions. So if you remember, we had some different resources, GEM, our regional access model, our global uh, access model, and then our GFS model. So in this case, because we have our access R model set as the default model, we can see that it's indeed showing the value that you can see here, where this the mean cloud cover in this little box of distance and time. And this is actually the variance uh, within this time window. So this is giving us a measure of the uncertainty of the prediction. And you can see that uh, the other models, they are actually uh, predicting zero clouds. And even within the X model, so their global and their regional run, there are differences between the values. You have to stitch it together, and the question is, how are you going to do this? And, well, because we uh, have some experience uh, strategists with us, um, we, in the end, come up with a certain value after a uh, discussion. Well, let's say we're going to stick with the cloud cover of 0 0.3, somewhere in between the different uh, sources for now. Do you think uh, taking a uh, mean or an average is a reasonable expectation? You could weight the different sources according to how much you trust them or something. Yep, and this also kind of shows you that every model comes with its own certainty and uncertainty, so that's why we need multiple models to verify and take a good guess. Yeah, yeah, so cloud prediction is actually pretty hard. So let's say that you wrongly predict the clouds in the second hour of your prediction. Then all the other hours are probably going to be off. For now, we will go with uh, 0 0.3. We'll click it, and then here we can see uh, in our screen that it's uh, actually, it says that our manual value is 0 0.3. Here we can see that now it has overwritten the whole forecast over there with the value 0 0.3. So normally we would uh, do this for all the little uh, boxes around the route, but for now we're just going to stick with this one. So I will just go to the next one, and it's going to initialize our custom forecast for, for wind U, which is uh, basically the wind in the north-south direction. So is the north-south direction wind also probably the headwind? Yeah, because we're driving from north to south, that means that, uh, so it's positive if it's going from north to south. And so basically a minus 8 here uh, means that we have a headwind of 8 meters per second. For us, it's uh, not good because uh, our main goal is to uh, finish within the time window using as many people as we can. So that's what. So what do we see here? We see some uh, pretty rough winds around Alice Springs. So... Uh, you can feel this wind, let's say. Here we see, see some uh, lesser winds, so around uh, zero meters per second. Let's do a little investigation along the route here. Just like I did with the uh, cloud coverage, I'm going to draw a little time window. 
we can see that the variance is uh, less than what we have with the cloud prediction. It's something which is pretty common. Well, clouds, they can range from uh, the value 0 to 1 uh, over 50 kilometers even or something, but winds, they are probably not going to move up and down by that much over a few kilometers. So the time window here is from 7 in the morning till uh, 4 in the evening. So this is a whole day. So we see the variance of the wind for a whole day in this uh, little time box and then for uh, 200 kilometers. We can also see that they are in a little bit better agreement than uh, we saw with the difference in the cloud forecast. So one thing to keep in mind is that it is a little bit dangerous to draw such a big time window because we are going to override a lot of valuable information over here. But uh, right now we're just going to give this as an example and normally your window would be uh, smaller. Let's just uh, stick with another value here, let's say minus 6, because that's where most of them are around. And then we're going to, in this case, ignore our GFS wind forecast. And you see that it overrides the box over there. OK, so we could also take a look at the side winds, but we're not going to do that for now, because it's very similar to our headwinds. And we will go on to our last variable, which is the solar irradiance, which uh, well, you would say is uh, the most important one. The, the yellow values are actually where there's a lot of solar, and the blue values is where it is night. I'm just going to make this window a little bit bigger so you can fully see that. And so this also has some amount of cloud cover taken into account, right? Uh, yes, exactly. So over here, there is a very high value of the solar irradiance, but over here, it's actually lower. It's actually 500 instead of, uh, let's say, 700. So that's uh, probably indicating clouds. Here we also see one problem with this uh, solar irradiance. Because it's so super time dependent, we can't draw the big box right now, because then we're going to really, really mess up this forecast. So. I'm just going to draw a small box over here, around Tennant Creek. And here we can see something which is very interesting, namely that one of our predictions seems to be way off. This well, can have to do with a lot of things, so maybe some pigment wrong when processing the file, let's say with for instance, the timestamps, let's say sometimes even something goes wrong in the uh, actual weather model running, and this furthermore shows why it's important to have different sources so that you're not dependent on one. So, uh, for instance, if we would only depend on the GEM resource in this case, we would have had a little problem. And so here you can see that there's not too much uh, variance. Let's say that we just go with this value. And then we see that it's actually a little bit tricky because we are overwriting our time-dependent value, So, which is what I already told you. So that's why we also tend to use, let's say, the cloud cover prediction and this method, because the cloud cover is way less uh, dependent on time. And then we combine our solar radiance forecast and our cloud cover forecast into a final uh, solar forecast. That was actually the, the demo, where we first took a look at our single forecast and then at our custom forecast, how we combine the different uh, sources into one uh, big fo forecast. Our key takeaways were that our main challenge was how to combine all those different weather uh, sources. And we came up with a solution for that. They built an XT diagram, distance and time diagram, where we basically combined all the sources. And we had our little uh, time distance boxes in which we could see the different outputs of the different sources, where we uh, also had a sort of a metric for the uncertainty of the different sources where it was the variance within the forecast and also the variance between the different forecast sources. And we also know that this sort of software can have a wide range of applications. For instance, I did my internship at the Renewable Energy Company, and for renewable energy companies, it's uh, very interesting to know what the weather is going to be like in the next day, because then they know how much wind energy they're going to generate and how much solar energy they're going to generate. And this is actually very important in also stabilizing the electricity grid. Thank you, Niels. I think that was really great. It's good to see the student competition teams actually solving real-world problems like this. And it's also great to hear that you got to use some of that knowledge in your actual internship experience. So that was great. Also good to see that even though this is an automotive competition, you're doing a bit of what we call data analytics, pulling data from different sources, 
manipulating it and doing some analysis with it. So thanks for sharing with us. If we need to know more about your team, where would we find you? Uh, you can find us on our website, uh, just show the team Eindhoven.nl. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, some uh, beautiful pictures on Flickr. You can check it out. Uh, it's really nice. Also about our last race, uh, where we once again became the number one in the cruiser class in the World Solar Challenge. So yeah, be sure to check that out. That's great to hear, Niels. Congrats on your victory in the recent uh, Solar Challenge. And for the other people who are listening to us, if you want to reach out to the Racing Lounge team, there are a few resources that we have here. With that, thank you again, Niels, and thanks everyone for joining us in this video. Thanks everyone and see you in the next video.